Welcome everybody who is on the call today. Um, my name is Katarina Bouchard from SCAN, the Scottish Communities Climate Action Network. And we're here today um, to talk about and exchange questions and answers about um, how to set up a community garden. So we've got um, a few speakers here that would like to share their experience of um, how they've done it and what they can also contribute to the topic because they've got a lot of experience in the subject from different angles. Um, so I'm welcoming here today, um, I've got Lou Evans from uh, Social Farms and Gardens. You could just want to say hello. Hmm. Hi, sorry, sat in my call off first. <laughs> Yes, hi, if you can just sort of introduce yourself briefly and what, well, what you do basically in the topic of community gardening. Hi, yes, can you hear me? I'm not sure. Our internet connection is a little bit intermittent. So apologies if I go. Can you hear me? Okay? Yes. I can hear you okay, yeah. Hello? Hello. Hi. Do you know? Would it make a difference, anyone who's a bit more technically proficient, would it make a difference if I turned off the video? It might improve it if your bandwidth is low, it might do, yes. Mine seems to have turned off anyway. It's just so saying a down. I'm going to turn the video off and see if that makes a difference in my engine. Well, just, just speak ahead and see if we can hear you. Right. Hi. Can you, you still hear me? Sort of. Can I turn off the video, everybody? No. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not really sure whether you can hear me or not. The problem. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can yes, hear you. I can not see you, but Hi. I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Katharina, can you send mail or something? Sorry? If you can hear me, could you, me any, could you send me a messaging? Does that work? Could that work? Yeah, we can hear you, Lou. Okay, all right. Hi. Um, so I was Social Farms, formerly Federation of Farms and Community Gardens. Um, and we, uh, there's one of us for support. Advocating for widely growing membership of about 170 last year of really not only but people involved in community growing and wide. So uh, you're part of a growing movement, which is um, our model early touch. It's based on support network. We've got a lot in common, a lot to share, and support developing. Network, I suppose um, advocating for them at policy level. And Lou, in a nutshell. Yeah, Lou, the connection is not really is good. Thing? I don't know if everyone else can hear you, but I can hear you only in a very sketchy manner. Yeah, it's pretty sketchy here too. Mm. Yeah. Lou, um, I'm, I'm not sure we can hear you very well at the moment. Ooh, um, we just, do you mind trying to log in again and see if that works any better? Because it was better before. Okay. And in the meantime, if I could ask Phoebe to... Talk yourselves. Yeah, if you can try and log in again. In the meantime, I'll ask um, Evie to introduce herself. Sure. Hi everyone, uh, so my name's uh, Evie Murray and I'm the founder and chief executive of Leith Community Crops and Pots, which is an uh, um, environmental charity, well environmental and social charity. Um, in my previous uh, career, uh, which seemed like a lifetime ago, uh, I worked as an um, addiction counsellor, mainly with heroin addicts. Um, what our charity boils down to really is expressing a concern for both people and the planet, uh, more precisely the well-being of what we call the biosphere. Uh, so improving uh, the food system and everything that flows from that, 
uh, and really looking at climate change, carbon reduction, biodiversity loss, and all these things, nature deficit disorder, so a whole eclectic mix of things. Um, so it follows on that really at the heart of our ethos is really connecting children to nature, living obviously in the context of living in such a densely populated urban area, uh, being ever so more important to get children out in nature. Um, but today I'm actually not going to talk to you too much about our charity, I'm going to talk to you really about the what you need to set up a community garden and I've actually decided not to actually focus on on the technical side of that so the creating a uh, creating a purpose creating your charitable purposes creating you know a skill or whatever different type of constitution you want to be I'm actually more focusing on what kind of um, characteristics you need to have as a human being and the process that you might go through as a human being setting up a community garden uh, because I think it's really important and probably quite integral to the whole uh, success or the overall success. So first of all, um, I think you need to work out what your reason is for doing it and I think that probably underpins everything that you do because I think uh, really working out what the needs is within your community and that could be various sort of multi-purpose needs it could be uh, quite a lot or it could just be a single issue and um, so things that uh, we certainly thought about when we were setting up our community garden uh, was uh, climate change and biodiversity loss uh, these were huge significant uh, factors for us um, but also it was about uh, pure human health uh, poverty and nutrition, uh, also isolation within the community, so therefore the word community being part of our charity name, so actually creating community around these issues. Um, so we followed really interesting people, someone that really resonated with me in the past has been Bruce K. Alexander who talks a lot about psychosocial dislocation, it's a really interesting theory and for me coming out of working in drug addiction for many years, Bruce K. Alexander kind of talked quite a lot about the environment being an external environment that has to be changed in order to fix quite a lot of community problems. Uh, and other people that have inspired our work has been Satish Kumar, who um, is the founder of um, Resurgence Magazine, which is a magazine that we subscribe to. I do try to get our team to read their articles very regularly to stay connected with um, people that inspire us. Um, but I suppose if once you've decided what your issues are, what the need is within your community, um, for us it's all these things. But for others, it might be it might just be completely environmentally driven, climate change, um, biodiversity loss, and, and soil depletion. For us, we've included everything, so social and environmental sort of purposes within our organisation. But I suppose I want to focus on what kind of people it is that you need to move things forward because I think it's, it's really important to getting things off the ground. And so, you know, you have to have quite a positive attitude. Uh, you have to be quite driven, I, I would say, and I have quite a high level of motivation. So it has to be something for, for me. Um, my experience has been that it, it needs to be sort of driven from a need within society and a real sort of purpose and I think um, because there are many things that can go wrong when you're setting up a community garden and if you don't have that underpinning um, things quite easily just stop quite easily because uh, I think there's a huge amount of challenges that go along with um, setting up a community garden. There are of course um, different kinds of community garden and I think that is also a factor because you could just decide that you're just going to have this as a little Saturday hobby that actually could go on like that for 10 years as just you know a connecting space where people meet on a Saturday and do a bit of growing together and that's all that that becomes. I mean I suppose for us it's become very different to that, it's actually become um, a career pathway for uh, for many people who work with us. It has become an a, a, a NGO that is working on multiple different um, levels in, in society. So we're working within schools, we're working 
um, um, in on a Scotland level with the Scottish Food Coalition, things like the Good Food Nation bills. We've been campaigning for a lot of these things. Um, so there are varying degrees of what kind of community garden you can have. Ours, I would say, is quite a developed over the last five year community garden, but you could just stick with it being just quite a, a sort of small organization that is locally run by a few people. And, and so really deciding what kinds of community garden you're going to be driving forward is probably quite important to sort of work out. And I think all of these are okay. Like, I think, you know, if it's a small uh, community garden that's just doing a little bit, what I've tend to find is that the organization that I run today actually kind of grows naturally with the plants. So organically things have just moved into various other areas um, and that's how it's, yeah, that's how our charity has developed. And um, so really kind of, what kind of community garden do you want to become? Um, I think it is probably essential to um, have a few dedicated, committed people. I know that Pat Abel is sitting here and going to talk to us a little bit, but I know that without Pat uh, being a centre focus, in her community garden and sticking with it through thick and thin, through all the challenges um, that that community garden probably wouldn't exist. I'm sure there are a lot of other key people around Pat, but I think similarly there has been a couple of people that have drive our organisation forward and stuck with it when things get tough. Because things can get tough when you're trying to set up a community garden. Um, and I think some of us were chatting just earlier just about having the right kinds of people because sometimes um, you can end up working with people who maybe have quite challenging issues. Um, you could of often be working um, full time, it would feel like, uh, for free. Um, so not earning any money, but still putting in many, many hours to your work. And if you do come across people who have quite complex needs, which you often do, um, then you also have to manage that. And if you're managing that as an unpaid volunteer, um, then you have to be pretty committed and dedicated to what you're doing. Um, I would say that probably the, the main things that would make a community garden sort of fall down would be not having the right people sort of driving things forward. Um, what else? Um, yeah, what if you end up working full time but not earning any money? How long could you actually, how many people could actually sustain a life like that when we do live in such an expensive world when we've got to buy our food or fuel? And I don't think any community garden is going to feed us in Scotland all the way down. It would have to be quite a big operation to be able to food feed you. Uh, so you do have to earn money. So you do have to factor in just how much uh, demand is going to be on your time. Uh, for us, we have quite a big piece of land. So that means quite a lot of people can be involved. And uh, if you've got quite a lot of people, that means that there are quite a lot of people that um, need support and want support and want to connect and want to get involved. And if that is uh, really falling on one person or two people or a few people that can be quite challenging so it is really important to delegate your work and get lots of people around you um, but the, that needs to be delegated to the right people I think sometimes we can maybe delegate stuff or be quick to delegate stuff and maybe that person isn't able to cope with the level of demand that's placed on them so a lot of careful planning and careful thinking and really building a really strong team around you um, so many tricky situations I suppose it's really important to turn setbacks into positive stories because um, there are many community gardens that get set upon by um, violent uh, sort of um, attacks like our bees got uh, some stones thrown at them, they got knocked over, it was pretty horrific but we managed to turn that into a really positive story in the end because we had quite a lot of social media on how important bees were within the community. So really taking any setbacks and sort of having you know a bit of a sort of um, like I say, that, that positive attitude is we can find solutions to this. If you start to feel quite overwhelmed and disheartened by what you're doing quite quickly, then, you know, there, there, there runs a risk. Um, 
really important to build political and local allies so to get people around you involved in what you're doing and gain as much community support and as much community participation as you possibly can and um, social media is obviously a really good campaigning tool for wider issues on um, climate change biodiversity all these things that we care about um, and then I think it's really important that if you have decided that you really want to go forward with this, I would say that it's probably a lifestyle change, a vocation rather than simply a career. Um, if that is an, a, a decision that you're going forward with, then make it as fun as you can and try to get out and get something as visible as you can um, where people can really sort of congregate and connect. Um, and I'm sure that if you have chosen your land and you've decided where you're going to base yourself, there are lots of technical things about who owns the land and speaking to the council and getting different people on board. But that, I think, first of all, deciding that you're prepared to do this um, is really important. And then moving on to more tangible things like identifying a piece of land um, and then working out what kind of model you're going to develop. Um, I could go on to talk a little bit about the fundraising battle if you decide that you are going to do this as a um, more um, organisation based with staff and with projects uh, in the way that we run the charity. Um, there are really difficult situations that go on with the fundraising um, and short termness of fundraising. Um, of funding short term of uh, funding projects uh, but also the the lulls and big funding projects and how you then manage to keep things going through difficult uh, funding periods um, but I, I could probably go on forever I'm not gonna because uh, I think it was just I'm probably at my five minutes but I'm happy to answer lots of questions in the q and &A. hope that's all right great thank you so much Thank you so much, um, Evie, for, for sharing that. Um, I think that's been, been really helpful. And you touched already on a lot of points on, you know, what what is community gardening in the first place? And then I think um, we need to perhaps distinguish between um, between the the first thing is that we basically need to say, okay, there is there are two types of, um, of gardens. There's one is community garden where actually everyone, you know, grows on the same plot of land and actually shares in the growing. And, and then there's allotment, which is um, what the um, leaf crops and pots, which I'm a proud member of as well. Um, one of the happy crofters in there, that, um, where we share basically, a, where you have allotments, but they are sort of, some of them are shared actually, and some of them are, are run by individuals or by families, as in my case. Um, so, you know, it's, um, so we have the, the gardening, the community gardening, the allotment world out there. And, and thank you so much for sharing your experience on that, Evie, on how you've been doing it, how you've been setting it up. Um, because I know firsthand how, um, how well it works and how, you know, the very different projects that there are, that are part of the um, leaf crops and pots. Um, last yeah. but not least, you know, the, the bees that you mentioned, we've got a beehive there. Um, that helps to pollinate um, the various plants that are growing around um, the, the, you know, the, the community um, allotments, but also, of course, the, the whole area, the whole neighbourhood around Leith in Edinburgh here. Um, so there are lots of sort of initiatives that can go on um, as part of a community garden. Um, now, um, sorry, I haven't mentioned earlier on that we're recording the session, so I hope that this is okay for everyone. If it's not, then you're free to log out. Um, and I, um, if you stay on, then I just assume that that's okay for you. Um, so in terms of um, other, another example of um, community gardening that we have. Now, we were supposed to have Margaret Watts from the Garnet Hill Community Garden in Glasgow today, but unfortunately she couldn't make it um, last minute. Um, so we have asked uh, my dear colleague Pat Abel from Gra the Grace Mount Community Garden and Transition Edinburgh South um, to share her experience of um, how she's been uh, working on, on her community garden and how um, you've, done, you've done it in okay, so it's, it's a different model than what's been happening in the um, leaf crops and pots. Um, so Pat, would you mind sharing your experience? Please? Not a problem, but following after Evie, who's obviously very much better prepared than I am for what to say. Um, I think one of the things that you probably didn't emphasize enough is you have to be a good problem solver because there are things that you don't expect come up um, and certainly um, I remember seeing her 
looking at the water management in her site. Um, and you have to get involved and do a lot of things that you don't expect to do. Um, we started in 2014, or end of 2013. Um, so we've been going quite a few years now. And we have gone for, it's a shared space that everybody has access to. Partly with the idea that the children and the schools are very much involved. Um, so we have got a lot of the primary school and um, high school. At high school, we are now helping to get their own garden started. And it's quite interesting. Within one term, they've decided they want to have a much bigger space than they, we thought they were going to have. So obviously it's working for them. Um, I think the other thing is, well, we've had definite problems because our, the mansion that we have used um, for offices has been shut for the past year. And obviously at two million pounds to renovate it, it's not going to be opened anytime soon, which means we've got problems of toilets and other things for both our gardener and the volunteers but we've had our gardeners since 2014 well right from the start um, so we are transitioning ever since so we're very much about climate change um, but the pro project has grown stronger because it's in a very deprived area and we're determined to actually increase the sorts of produce that we will have access to eventually um, I think Evie mentioned like of the last child in the woods and this We've lo we're lucky enough to have one head teacher that that's very much his belief that he wants the children out and we're lucky enough to have wild space. So we start with the primary ones and they learn how to den build. And that surprised us because in some ways, because the primary one teacher said it was tick box things, great for biodiversity, great for climate change, but it was particularly good for team building. And things that you don't realize and you can see how that actually strengthens everything you do within whatever category so there's lots of things that you just don't quite expect come up um, we've had we do have uh, we did have a lot of um, vandalism at first but that has died down although there's always the occasional spurt um, We've got one poor lime tree that looks as if it's at the end of its life because the kids turn on the water tap and it gets left on and that poor tree is waterlogged, we realise, because there's another lime tree right beside it and it looks fine. Um, so, I don't know, I'm not sure how we could cure that one actually. But it's an interesting, and I think, I think you can't get away from actually the social because we are very lucky, we've got a very good gardener who with teachers and people's trust. And so we end up with one-to-ones with some children. And um, there are some people who end up very much using him for a social. And I have said that basically the gardener is a community worker and a social worker, more or less. And that's something that I brought up in the NHS gardens strategy group and um, the person that works in Midlothian came over and said that's exactly what I do as well. And I think a gardener, if you're working outdoors, it is very much therapeutic and however much you may be trying to cure thing may climate with it, you've got to recognise that's very much part of it as well. Um, we've started with uh, working with Charles Dowding's uh, teaching of gardening, so it's no bare earth and no, pre, um, no dig and no bare earth. And we're going along that track. We've got two wildflower meadows and that's interesting, the, all the different things and that's some perennials and a mixture of um, annuals. Um, but it's interesting and just how much you can start to promote because the biggest problem we had was right at the start. We didn't realise that the whole of one half of the garden didn't have any earth. It had nice grass, but there was no earth below it. There was gravel. There had been eight inches of a uh, tennis court. So we had to start with beds and build up the earth from there. Um, we're interested because I think there are experiments that are being done around the world that actually can start to work with that. Um, we may try 
a test of that ourselves at, at the Grace Mount. But we get some really fantastic um, stories about youngsters. One 16 year old that had come out of school with nothing, loved gardening. We got him into Oatridge. He came out of Oatridge and he wants to do, um, to get qualifications because he wants to be a youth worker and help other people to find something that they really like to do. So there's some really fantastic stories you can get out of the gardens because it's a fantastic place to be. Um, and we're getting, we have got a few volunteers there building up, even though we haven't got the toilets at the moment. We're looking to get a porter cabin. We're looking to get an asset transfer from the council, both of the garden and the ruined stables, which we hope to turn into a food hub. So there's lots of things that you don't expect to have to deal with. Um, so we're in conversations with the council, and that's never, never a fast thing. It's, it's always um, somewhat, they don't work at the speed that you need. We're even to try and get a porter cabin in and get the link tap to um, sewage and electricity and stuff. As yet, we haven't got agreements that they'll do that for us, and even if we find the monies to do it. So it's um, very much a case of taking time. I think gardens teach you patience, I think, and nothing else, along with the growing. Um, so it's, it's certainly something that we have no intention, even though the things that have been chucked at us, we have no intention of giving up because we're very conscious that we have got wild space around the garden as well. And children don't have that kind of space to play in. And this is what we found certainly with the den building, that children and a lot of the teachers weren't used to being outside and it's a different priority for them. Um, we did two days a couple of weeks ago at Holyrood Park on their outdoor classes, um, teaching children. And I must admit, I think certain vegetables are just not well known by the children. Although one little girl pointed at potatoes and said, that's not a vegetable, it's a carbohydrate. And you're thinking, okay. Um, so you get so many different things that you don't expect and it's great to have to deal with it. So I think community gardens, and we've got to start to look at the fact that currently the way we're growing, our vegetables lack the nutrition that they had in the 1950s when I was young. Um, I, mean, I think the best little song that I ever heard was the Beta Carry Team one that one carrot in 1951, you'd have to eat five carrots now to get the same minerals. So we've got challenges and hopefully once we can rise to, um, I think that's the main thing. There's plenty of, if anybody wants to ask questions, they're welcome. Great, well, thank you so much for, for your input on that. It's really good to hear, Pat, how in Grace Mound, you've actually, you, the focus um, of your work has been much more on um, on on the social aspects of it. Um, so it's it's been good to to see that a little bit in in contrast of um, of what's been done in in the leaf crops and pots, where the focus is really much more on the um, on the natural side of so climate change, biodiversity. There is of course a community element as well, but um, I feel like in Grace Man, that's really um, part of. Yeah, the raison d'être, you know, the, the reason for being of the entire organization of um, how you how it's working, how it's functioning. So it's really great to hear this kind of story of um, how, you know, young people can can get also, you know, a future by simply, you know, starting to work in a community garden and um, and finding their passion there. So that's that's really interesting to hear. Thanks. And um, can we then yeah. try? Sorry. You have to look at the education and that's certainly something we are doing. So the Grace Mount High School, they have asked that the children get a certificate. So we're working with RHS to make sure that they get a certificate. But hopefully there's ongoing qualifications that can start to come out of it as well. So there will be a sustainable element in, from that point of view as well. Excellent. Well, thank you then. Um, can I suggest to uh, pass on to, um, let's try and pass again to Lou, and hopefully we can hear her better this time. Um, Lou, would you mind, and I think that's actually quite a nice way around to have some sort of concrete examples of 
um, of community gardens. And so, Lou, if you could, um, if you could share um, how your organization works and what you can provide, um, I think that actually nicely rounds off um, the social aspect of it um, because you provide support rather than actually being a community garden. So, Lou, can I ask you um, how the organization works, what you do? It looks if Lou's cast. Lou, can you hear us? Hi, can you can anyone hear me? Yes. No. Oh god, this is annoying. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Can you hear me so annoying this technology wise anyway? Katerina, I'm gonna ask you to your thumb up. And if you can't if you stop hearing me, then put your thumb down and I'll just send something by the text. Great. Okay. Um, hi, Pat. Hi, Evie. Really nice to hear you um, bring some real life examples to the table of some of the um, the, the kind of many, many benefits that um, community growing can, can support, but actually also some of the realistic challenges. I suppose given the, the nature of the the uh, the line being um, a little bit intermittent, I I guess possibly what I'll do is I will send you uh, a, a little bit of text that are, they're just key points I was going to talk about our service and I guess needless to say that we offer an inquiry service and so I think when you're at the stage where either Evie or Pat was talking through some of these issues about um, what's our model, how are we going to do this, do we want to be entirely volunteer led, are we going to seek funding? If we are going to seek funding, why should anyone pay for it? What's special about us? Um, how can we join with forces with another organization and make ourselves stronger? What are the opportunities at policy level? Um, how do we do this in a way that we can sustain and engage the community? Um, and any of those other questions that Sorry, my screen keeps changing. Can you still hear me, Catherine? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Sorry, I just put up an, um, the main slide because it's just so that we have something a bit more visual to see than sort of a black screen. If that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and then the, the other kind of, yeah, I guess, shall I spend a lot of time supporting people at the start of the journey, quite all really exploring vision, mission, and set we're not scared to ask the really difficult questions that are, you know quite often I think as individuals we get so carried away with the long-term vision actually some of the practicalities uh, are missing um, and I guess that's what we're here to do is to really support people think through and make sure it's a robust model that's fit for purpose and sometimes you know you're part of an enormous network that you know many of the models are entirely volunteer led on back greens or small pockets of of verge really where people are just getting together and doing their bit for wildlife meeting each other getting out having fun and um and actually playing increasingly playing a really important part in the the climate resilience dialogue um and on that basis it's kind of real honor to present the neck that's kind of really queried and, and up to really really stuff you think it is worth being pragmatic and i really value your um input on that e and, and your experience the t's and and that react to our model which is about um being privileged to have a kind of a bird's eye view of what's going on for people and really short people's experience both good and bad so you know very limited resource and very limited time be it pay or volunteer time um can go further we've got a number of ways that we support the network through doing that the obvious one is something like the city learning exchange which is supported through the scottish, scottish government to support communities learning directly from each other um, another couple of things very quickly um, membership is free i would really encourage you to go on www.farmgarden.org.uk the scotland page um, and you'll see a great sketch note there that's new of kind of just what a diverse and exciting bunch of people you are and if that kind of talks to you then please do join us and sign up to get our monthly um, newsletter and make contact use the advisory service and and um, contact us to either talk through your model or actually increasingly we just talk to people about you know what they're struggling with um, spend a lot of time uh, listening and talking to people about 
changing tack slightly or you know managing i think he and um somebody else sarah on the meadows hello talked about um you know recruiting the right kind of volunteer and and how you manage community warts and all and what that looks look, looks like so we've heard it all before and um yeah please do contact us as and when you need support i suppose um, it's it's a bit odd talking to a black screen, so I'm going to stop now because I can ramble on for hours and everyone would fall asleep. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Lou. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, it's a little bit. Sorry, of a... that was a bit of a ramble. I, it's the whole the technology thing. You think it's a great idea, but actually, when we're all in the business of people, it's extraordinarily hard, isn't it? <laughs> it, it, because it, I can't yeah, see you. Technicalities are getting the the better of us, it seems. Um, yeah. So I, I had you fine on the screen earlier on, but unfortunately you've disappeared now and I can only see a black screen um, when, when you start speaking. So, um, but, but yeah, the quality anyway was better now. So we were able to at least um, to hear you. So that, that's very good. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing. So um, Lou, what basically had the type of sort of support services you provide to community gardens that are already active and um, or the ones that you know want to develop their their activities. Um, so it's it's good to hear that you guys are out there as well because you are specialised, of course, on community gardens um, across the UK. Um, and I think you've got quite a by um, quite a quite a big um, membership as well, don't you? Yes, yep, uh, 276 at the last count. So um, it's interesting because the policy environment is very supportive of sort of in general community growing initiatives and um, there's quite a lot of provision under the Community Empowerment Act, certainly through part nine to support community growing initiatives. I think kind of uh, the long term issue will be where, you know, what that support looks like and um, how people kind of get involved in um well yeah so there's currently local authority in, um, consulting on something called food growing strategies and if you want to work at policy level or you want to make an ask of local government i would encourage you to get involved in your local food growing strategy and if you're unsure how contact us um what we're not sure is where the resource will come from uh, that legislation or that legal requirement kicks in at the end of March next year actually how that's going what that's going to look like and how that's going to happen so would um, yeah if you have more information come back to us but this is your opportunity to ask local authorities to tell them what you're up to um, and actually also make your ask you know what would what what more resource would make a difference and how whilst whilst yes understand that their hands are somewhat tied and their resources increasingly limited too but if you don't ask you don't get that old nutshell the old principle um who doesn't, yes. doesn't get anything um that's true Elu, and it's it's really good to to hear that you you know provide support in in an environment as you rightly pointed out um where you know there's less and less financing available even though there's more and more demand for such a um for this type of activity where people come together where people do something also for the environment now you know we've had the the global climate strikes um that well have been very big but that have been happening for a while actually um and um and so everyone is asking now okay well you know we want we need to do something about climate change what can we do and so you know one of the things one of the solutions that we wanted to point out with this as well with this session is to say well you know the link between climate change and gardening um is is there and there is a there is it is a solution of course it's not the only solution but it is a solution and we'd like to just with this kind of session get people give people a kind of a tool and some initiative some you know some support encouragement as well to um to you know to get going uh, with new activities new initiatives or indeed um as as you you mentioned but i think i'm not sure it came out quite clearly because the audio wasn't that good um to actually just get you know get involved with existing initiatives that are already out there you know such as the grace Month, such as 
um, these crops and pots. And then there are many others around Scotland um, that are that are already existing. Get in touch with them and um, and see how you can help out. Because um, as as both Pat and Evie have pointed out as well, a lot of it um, does run based on volunteer contributions and has to indeed um, run on volunteer contributions because there is no um, not much financing available. But at the same time, it can provide a good outlet and a good um, um, purpose for people to actually get involved in, in their own neighborhood and their own environment where they live um, and give them so give them something useful to do and do something good for the environment and also indeed fight against climate change. So when we talk um, climate change, um, I'd say the two big topics that come to mind, the two big factors that come to mind. Um, are that um, that it helps to um, help to sequester carbon um, and then of course there is also the aspect of just the simple food growing that helps us to um, uh, to to reduce our food miles um, so to buy less stuff that comes from possibly sometimes the other end of the world you know I regularly see fruit and veg that gets shipped in from New Zealand and South Africa and places like that um, so it's, it's madness you know to, to have to buy um, uh, food from from literally the other end of the world um, so if we can you know um, if we can satisfy at least part of the demand we have for food um, in Scotland from locally grown produce well let's let's just do it you know and have fun while we're at it um, so with that I would really like to just also give um, a pass the floor to to all our participants yeah and just to hear from all of you of um, where you are are you involved in a community organization and have you got any burning questions for our um, for our speakers so perhaps I'll just um Go through who I've got on my screen, on my screen, on my video, and the topics that we've done, and people who are also involved in today. Um, introduce yourself briefly, and just let us know where you are in your grow growing journey. Are you involved in anything? Um, are you part of a community? Would you like to start up one? Um, what's your what's where are you in the journey? And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to to ask those as well. Hi, um, thank you very much for that. I wanted to ask Pat about these certificates. You have to get. You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself, Pat, if you're going to hear. Your your mic has been muted, Pat. So you need to. There's a little button. Can you hear right. us? Yes, right. there you go. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Hi, Pat. You're developing certificates. That's not something I'm very keen on. Um, just you know, because it's a great way of um, validating the effort that people put in. Yes. So can, can, you, can you let me know when you've done them? <laughs> because I know it takes a lot of working out. And yeah. you can share them, you see, that would be a common resource, it'd be great. Yes, no, I, I think the, the certificates, somehow finding more people seeing this as a career, um, because it will be. There well, will absolutely, it's a, it's a first step anyway. It's, a, it's something to show that they've been doing something. Well, that's exactly what they're they are. They are. Yeah. And it's great. And you can just write what the things that they have been doing and it's all a learning curve. Yes. No. Okay. So, so we can get together if you want. But I mean, I'd just be so good to do something like that <laughs> together. Yes. I think there's strength in numbers. And I think that that's one of the things we've got to start to do is to actually get together. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a deal then. <laughs> Thank you. Is Lou still there? Right. I am here. No, I was just wondering. I, I presume we don't have to rejoin now you've changed your name. Do you need to? Lou, you need your um your no, music. I don't I don't think Lou is here actually, Pat. Yeah. She Lou's online. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, next next week. Because I'm also Hello, uh, I'm here. Hello. <laughs> sure. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, hi. I am here. I am here. We just we have a dreadful internet connection, and sometimes it's fine. And today, typically, it's awful. I agree. Uh, yes. No. You don't need to rejoin. You're absolutely fine, despite our name change. That's all right. I just suddenly thought when you were talking about it. <laughs> but no, there's there is so much to do in the whole of this area because it's just not been something that people have been doing there. 
What, what's this? Which is the certificate? So what should we be talking about now? It's, it's just knowledge and understanding of what we're doing. How you do. oh, yeah. Well, that's right. Well, of course, there are other things to do, like, you know, scientific surveys, getting people to count insects and, you, you know, identifying flowers and what have you. Those are lovely things to do if you can get the right people. Yes. <laughs> lots of worms now uh, because we do compost and we do a lot uh, and we make sure our ground is covered. So it's having a difference. Yeah, that's good. Okay, I wanted to sort of bring up my contribution, which is that you really don't need to pay anybody. And I think that's an important thing for people to know. Yes. You know, because we started off as a community group and our ethos was we're not going to have any jobs here. We're all going to be in it together. And I do think it's important, you know, for the sustainability of a group not to rely on a paid operative who's going to tell everybody how to do stuff and then they're going to depend on being told. So, our, you know, our community the garden is very small, but it is um, envisaged as a learning opportunity for everybody. So everybody turns up saying, I don't know how to do whatever. And so they learn, you know, and that's, we're all learning. And that's, that's, the, that's the part of the, um, the curve, um, which everybody can join in. Um, so that's a, I thought that was a point worth making because, you know, you don't need to pay someone. <laughs> and, uh, but you do need everybody to be involved. So it's a, it's a sort of balancing trick. <laughs> Well, Sarah, can you maybe, because um, um, I see, well, if you could just maybe introduce yourself where I, you seem to be active in a community garden already, the one in the meadows, I suppose, in, in Edinburgh, if I, if yes, I yes. can correctly. So would you mind just explaining a little bit about how, how you guys work, if it's all volunteer run? Yes, the community garden on the meadows started as a community group concerned about um, environmental issues, as you've already explained. And um, that's, so we started off with a wildflower plot, which was fairly low maintenance on the meadows, and it's still there and it's doing fine. It's a self-perpetuating um, wildflower plot and it's lovely. But one of our members then said, what about growing vegetables? She's a French woman. <laughs> and uh, so um, we asked um, Mike Shields, who's the park manager, you probably all know, and um, he said, where do you want to have it? This was in, in 2014. And, um, I wasn't aware at the time that the council had um, signed up to environmental program. <laughs> so we were basically the answer to prayer. So we set up this um, community garden on the meadows near the tennis courts with um, um, seven raised beds and um, a bit, little by little, then an orchard. We've got five apple trees. And then more recently, we've built a compost, um, a compost uh, nest and we've got a um, an outdoor classroom and um, all these things are very modest structures, they're not even structures because you're not allowed to have any on the meadows, um, but um, they are all the fruit of people's pulling together and doing it themselves. We have a picnic table which is, it was a big job getting that installed, but we did it ourselves and I think this is part of a, a garden, is that it's a slow process, it takes you know a while getting anything done and if something's broken then you can mend it because you know it's all part of the process. Anyway, that's enough about us. <laughs> um, but um, just have a look where on the meadows and there's loads of people. Sarah, walk. can you hear? Me? Hello, hello. Well, I can. We oh, can, I can hear you. Sarah. Just keep going. Okay. Well, if you walk past um, the tennis courts on the meadows or North Meadow Walk, you can see us. And we do spend an awful lot of time talking to people. <laughs> and and um, we're a very we're a very big group of people nominally, but actually a, about a small group of about twenty people who actually turn up regularly. And that's plenty for a small garden. You know, you don't need a lot of people. And uh, so we're having our AGM on Saturday. And one of the questions which is going to come up is sustainability which is one of the reasons why I'm interested to hear what people have to say here because that's always an issue isn't it <laughs> how to keep going so more ideas please <laughs> right, thanks so much for bringing that up um, Sarah because that is indeed uh, one of the topics that I think well that, that are valid for really any kind of initiative that you know are set up by by volunteers or indeed not by volunteers you know by a group of, um, of people that set up uh, some kind of project might get funding for it um, and then what you know once the funding runs out and Evie mentioned that already um, earlier on as well the, the, the struggle of you know getting financing for projects and that can be great you know there are 
um, great opportunities like the Climate Challenge Fund that also fund that, this type of activity, um, community gardening. Uh, and, and it's great that these funds exist. Um, the Robinson Trust, I think, is another one which, which, is, um, which is quite a, a well-known one. Um, so you have you know, sources of funding that are available for this type of activity. And they, uh, indeed, for, for the, the different aspects of it, you know, like Pat mentioned, there's also the social aspect, trying to get, um, trying to get perhaps um, young people that are um, not performing well at school integrated and giving them um, a professional future, um, or, or indeed, you know, other, other groups of people that might, might be disadvantaged. Um, so there are, there are opportunities for, for involving different groups of people in the community gardens, and I think that's indeed one of the big strengths of them as well, um, that it can bring uh, different, um, different, different community groups, different communities, different communities all together, together, um, and um, and make them work on on a common on a common activity. So I think it's a really, really good, um, really good, good thing to do. Um, but the sustainability indeed is, is a big question. So perhaps um, to everyone who hasn't um, spoken yet, and I see uh, Robin, you, you've got a question in the chat, I'm, I'm taking note of it, but let's come to it after, after this. Um, uh, if I can uh, just ask a question to, yes, what do you think about sustainability? How can you achieve sustainability in, in the Have you got any thoughts on that? Or perhaps any experience? Katrina, Jillian, Kate, um, Jim, hi, nice to see you as well. Andra, Robin. Catherine, there's quite a few. Sarah, so anyone who will, feels like when they want to say something, you can just um, raise your hand. Yeah, Jim, you, you want to say something? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. Yeah, just um, it, it's very related to it. I've just been at a, a session, or a couple of things recently. One of them was learning for sustainability, another uh, kind of Scottish government program that's rolling out learning for sustainability more teacher training around it and so on and there's an opportunity to identify your resource within learning for sustainability so it may mean that you get more engagement from local schools um, to use the garden for part of what they are obligated or becoming more obligated uh, to do within the learning for sustainability agenda. I won't go into it in detail because I've just found out about it and I'm going to follow it up myself and I'll pass the information back through uh, to Katerina and maybe she can distribute it uh, out to other people as well. Um, uh, another a kind of question I've got, I was looking for the map of the gardens in Edinburgh. I used to be under um, Edmund Lothian Garden Partners, I think it was, but no, not Garden Partners. Uh, the Green Space Trust. The yeah, Green yeah, Space Trust, yeah. yeah. I had a look at it recently and I could only see, it seems to have changed, there are only about five gardens on it. So I just wonder really? where that is and if you could, you know, somebody could inform, not necessarily here, but if you could get that out to me to let me know where it is. Because I had people saying, where is the nearest garden? I've come all the way to this one, but I'm looking for, or I, you know, I've come across people and say, where's my nearest garden? Where could I do this? Um, so I'd love to be able to just point them to that um, that map, and they can work away from there. The, and just yeah. The um, Lothian Green Space Trust, Jim. This is Lou. Used to have quite a comprehensive map. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's what I, I was looking at that um, on Sunday, and there, there only seemed to be five maps, oh. unless it's just changed in some way. That, uh, but if if I could just ask somebody to kind of you know check it out and if they know more about it to maybe let uh, katrina know as well because again it's like advertising for uh promoting people who are interested pointing them in, in the right direction um and and then the, the last thing I, I would say is i've just had been to um a session called art of mentoring or eight shields and it's very much uh, it's a it's a it's about village building or community building and it's a guy who's spent a long time um, being in that village building himself and looking at indigenous communities and how they build villages and little things that help for instance you know when you get together you have the opportunity to identify where you are in your place and you know open it a round of discussion say well how, how was your trip here today where did you come from uh, and that was just like one little thing that that people tend to do to to really appreciate where they are and where they've come from, 
And another aspect of it is having people within the organization identified as having a particular role or, or filling a particular role. For instance, um, we're, we're going to have an event next uh, weekend. And, and one of the things, we'll have somebody who, who greets people as they come in. Um, so we'll have that kind of, that role will be quite clear that this is the person. It's not just a case of, well, you are on the, on the gate. It's more a case of, well, you're the kind of person who would be good at getting people in and, uh, in, you know, having that kind of uh, invitation, making them feel welcome. And then there would be somebody else whose role is typically to make sure that people are well nourished and not necessarily always feeding and drinking them, but just keeping an eye out to see, you know, somebody's dehydrated here. Maybe they're some more dehydrated because it's quite, it's quite kind of... Uh, warm today or more likely it's quite cold and i can see somebody being a bit nippy and just just kind of encourage people to you know put another layer on or just that kind of um holding the space for everybody um I, they're just two of the roles there are other ones there are roles for elders there's the roles for the youths um and and so on so um at call art i'm mentioning our eight shields.org the, the number eight um, and there's some activity goes on in Scotland at the moment. And we got one of the uh, people who's doing a lot of work in it to come in and give our organization a talk on it. Um, and it was really, it was really good to delve a bit deeper into how indigenous people hold their communities together uh, very well. And, and I think holding that gar the community garden space as a place of community together in a very, in a very good way um, is is the opportunity to make it more sustainable because more people are engaged, not just around the growing, but the wider community aspects uh, of of what's what's going on in their community um, and more connected. I'm sure lots of people are doing that already, but I, I also hear of oh we had a gar we had the gardener in for a year and then when the gardener went, it all kind of fell apart again. Um, so the importance of village building or community building as part of um, as part of the community gardens is just what I'm putting out there. Mm -hmm. Thanks Thank so much for, for sharing that, Jim. Again, it's, I think the the importance of you know having the right the right people on board or getting them involved in the right activities that are suitable for them is is really mm -hmm. what what you're saying is so um once again this this idea of you know making sure that you also use the best talent um of the people that that are involved um or indeed try and look for people that have the talents that you need um for your community garden that's a really important point now and um, we're running um short of time we're actually sort of um, running a bit late already so i'll just um, I'll address this last question here that um, we had from Robin um, for Pat um, and then I would like to close. Um, so um, Pat, there's a question here for you. Um, you mentioned that Grace Mount had difficulty growing on gravel, so used beds. Do you know of the other technologies being trialed to overcome this challenge? If you could just give us a quick reply to that one. What technologies did you did you try to basically um, tackle the the non soil issue to not having you know proper soil? What I find interesting is that we got worms on those um, uh, beds that are laid on gravel. So where the worms came from is another question. Did they come up through the gravel? Um, but there is an experiment that's been done, I think, in New Zealand or Australia that looks very promising. Um, and they managed to create a layer of five inches of soil over pumice within about seven months. And it's quite interesting to see what that is. That starts to be working with the microbes. So it's an interesting journey we've got. But no, I could share that. Um, it's a, a, it's a, actually a YouTube. I could get uh, give that link. Okay, that would be great. Um, I think there's been a, um, a few things um, you know Jim has mentioned, you've mentioned, and if anyone else indeed, you know, for the map or for for that link, if you could just share it with with me um, after the webinar today, and then I'll make sure to send it around to everyone who's taken part in the call today. Sarah, last last word to yes, you. Yes, hi. I do have a last point. It's building on what Seamus has been saying about community. I think the primary function of community is to offer a welcome 
And we do, we welcome everybody who comes, you know, whoever they are, school children, um, refugees, um, other, other groups, you know, and, um, and that's something everybody in the community, in our group does. It's not just a one person thing. I do think this is, you know, when it comes to skills, everybody should have them. And that's part of what Community Garden's about. It's sharing skills. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, are there any other last burning questions? Not from what I can see now. So I suggest that we, well, we close for today. I think there's been some really interesting points raised about um, community growing in general and um, just um, the issues that, well, that some are quite surprising, you know, some are quite not like, you know, logical. You can think, okay, you need some land to, to obviously um, that you can use to build on. How do you get hold of that? And that's a whole other conversation, um, whole procedure through and with the council. And Evie's pointed that out a little bit. That it's important to get um, that, that political support as well so you can actually get hold of land that you can use for growing. Then you have very concrete resource struggles you know um getting access to water to water your plants are da i mean the, the most logical thing you need water not always so easy to get um having a soil to grow on we mentioned a couple of times today so um couldn't be any more basic than that you know yes indeed <laughs> growing spaces are not actually good growing spaces and um there are also different qualities of soil which again makes for a different you know a growing experience altogether um, seeds and plants, of course, so you know that's sort of that's the basic stuff, but then also some issues were raised like about um, problems like vandalism that seem to occur quite frequently in, in some community gardens. Certainly we have that problem in the in the leaf crops and pops pots and unfortunately quite regularly. And um, uh, so yes, there are there are issues that, that may be obvious and some less obvious um, that come to mind and that need to be taken into account for um, for for building up running it and uh yes having a community garden and of course then there's the sort of the the uh the, the untouchable the the ones that the they're not tangible ones um that are things like what pat mentioned you need a lot of patience to do this you know because whatever you do whether it's applications for land whether it's in applications for funding whether it's trying to get people involved whatever it is you will need a lot of time and patience and you will need to put in a lot of um, effort and uh, yeah, effort to, to just um, get people involved uh, and active. And of course, last but not least, Sarah's pointed that out um, quite nicely, um, in volunteers and making sure you have the right volunteers on board is something that is crucial for running a, a community garden. Um, and allotment uh, and and make it sustainable indeed um, because um, funding may be there for a while it may not be um, as we know it's all very volatile um, so if you can figure out a structure for a community garden that actually makes it um, that makes it run even if there is no funding or little funding um, then you're set um, for a for a good future um, but if you rely solely on on funding it might it might be difficult at some point or it might become difficult and and just end so yes I think it's a, a lot of interesting points that were raised today so thank you so much for <laughs> joining this today and um, and it's been great to, to have you all here. Um, like I said, the whole um, the whole um, webinar will be recorded and the um, to report will be available for you to um, to get back on. And if I could, like I said, um, just remind um, um, Jim and Pat, and if there is anyone else who would like to share any resources um, that may be useful for for everyone to share, please send them to me by e email um, to info at Scottish Communities Can. Dot org dot uk. Um, I will pick them up and compile them together and send them out in an email to you so that you have it all together and you can use that um, for your journey. So thank you so much for joining and uh, I'm looking forward to having you on the next uh, month perhaps and the next Tuesdays for Climate which is taking place um, in uh, what is this now we are in October so that'll be in November. It's the 5th of November if I'm not mistaken. Let me just double check that. Um, yes, indeed, it's on the 5th of November, our next uh, Tuesday for Climate session. So please sign up for those as well if you're interested. 
and we'll see you next time. And if you have any questions, um, just contact me by email. Um, like I said, info at Scottish Community Can. I'm going to put that in the chat now as well, um, so people have it there. And then hopefully see you next time. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks a lot to our speakers, Evie, Pat, Thank and Lou. Thanks. Thank Sorry about the technology. That's right. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.